Whittier, founder, host, and mentor. And I'm here with Richard Paquette again. Welcome, Richard. Good afternoon, Lee. Looking forward to a nice session again today. I know. Today we're going to talk about breed standards and we're going to talk about presentation in relation to breed standards. And today we've chosen the Doberman Pinscher as a, as a starting point for what we want to talk about. So this kind of conversation is the kind of conversation that happens at every session at Dog Show Mentor program. So Richard, we talked a little bit about this um, before we came on and just in terms of the standard and how we like to see dogs presented and how we each individually as judges weigh different points of each standard. So we're going to take the Doberman standard and um, use it as an example. So why don't we go ahead and start with, you know, when you judge Dobermans and you're standing in the middle of that ring and you've got, let's just say six dogs, because, you know, that's a, that's an average entry today. Say you have six dogs in front of you and you've got to make your, your choices. You're going to make a placement. It's the open dog class. Maybe it's open black. What are you thinking? Well, you always have your first impressions and that, that's where I would suggest to all of your students to be mindful of that first impression. If your class walks in the ring and the there's only five or six dogs and the judge is looking right at you, you need to go for a free, free stack. If you're going to get pegged as fussing with the dog, trying to stack it perfectly. When the judge is looking, you're going to lose points. Sometimes you'll lose the points subliminally where a judge will look at you fussing with your dog instead of showing that beautiful, you know, side view, which is, a, which is really part of the essence of the breed, a dog looking elegance and muscular, square, well bit, well built, well muscled. And if you're busy leaning over it, trying to stack every leg, as that judge is looking at you in the first impression, you've already put yourself down negative 30. So walk in that <laughs> ring, exude some confidence that truly you feel your dog is built well and can, you know, can just be shown in its natural state. I see handlers fussing with their dog all the time. What does it matter? If one foot is in front of the other by three inches, if indeed, you know, the toes are pointing straight ahead, the legs are parallel to each other, the pasterns are strong, and you have that beautiful tight foot, why would you want to fuss with the dog and pull that leg back underneath it? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Well, you know, it's it's funny you should say that because I so often find that when people are, are trying to get that dog stacked correctly, that the dog puts his foot you know, the, the leg in the, in the right place. And the handler keeps moving it out of place. But in, in the Doberman, um, when I'm in the middle of the ring, I'm thinking, okay, let's see. Let's start with square, right? Let's start with square. Square, square is just a basic of the breed. Let's look at whether they have some forechest. And are they balancing? Is the rear balance to the front? And when I approach that dog, I want to feel that that has some under jaw. When I put my hand under that jaw, I want to feel that that head in my hand as though um, it's there's some substance there. It's it is not uh, weedy or insignificant in any way. Because as you pointed out, this is a, a, a muscular breed that has the essence of this breed is powerful and elegant. They're noble, and, right? And They're noble. Intelligent looking. And, you know, obviously, yes, we are looking for that beautiful square proportion, but we're also looking right from the head. Uh, you know, when you're looking at a side view and a handler is correctly showing their dogs with those ears and, and erect and alert facing forward. And then you have the beautiful, well-arched 
neck going into a nice smooth transition into a nice level top line and a well set tail carried properly there's nothing more exciting to look at and and again that first impression so here here's here's something you said that that i always look at the standard and as a judge i ask myself the question so th this standard actually says that the top line should extend in a straight line from the withers to the slightly sloping croup, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't say level, it says straight. And that, and, and some other top lines descriptions do use the word level. So it could be straight and sloping at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and that has a lot to do with the balance, uh, whether you have, you know, well laid back shoulders, you know, that are, the withers definitely higher than the croup because like you say it's a straight sloping top line but you know does it look like that is the dog slouch right. does the dog look <laughs> muscular you know and and that's why i stress you know you need to work with your dog and get it to look at you whatever incentive it may be whether it be bait his favorite toy just your smiling face but if you do not have your dog trained to focus on you, you can't properly show them off. And then well, you know, you know, it's what you said last time you were here is that five minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And we have always promoted that concept at Dog Show Mentor, but I loved how you said it and you got your point across so well that um, a couple of my members um, have been using that, just that key point, five minutes a day. And, um, have been doing quite well with that so mm -hmm. and and move interested. you know we're talking a bit specifically on dobermans but let's move to all breeds of dogs the proper speed for your breed okay <laughs> and even the doberman should not be raced around the ring you know they are an efficient trotter they are a protection breed so they're more used to working in a close quarter and their real function when they're working is a gallop not a trot so you know racing them around the ring is not what you want you want a beautiful effortless movement with good reach and drive demonstrating how a well-built trotter should be uh, too many people move them too fast and uh, you know string them up and uh, you know the 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 ideal situation would be to get your, your lead such that you have control of the dog, but it appears to be moving in a, on a loose lead, which is much more beautiful when your judges are making their assessment of your dog anyway. So keep all those things in mind. First impressions, and then when you're moving, to be moving at the right speed for your breed. That is absolutely so important. The Havanese should never, you should never have to run. You should never have to run with a cairn. I mean, uh, loose lead breeds, right? Loose lead, the cairn, the Havanese, um, even the mini schnauzer, right? Um, the Doberman should have that cadence of a Doberman and the cairn should have a cadence of a cairn. Mm -hmm. And the cadence is so important, the foot timing. And so we went over this recently in, in one of the Dog Show Mentor um, master classes. And I was surprised that at how many people didn't understand what cadence and foot timing are. Mm -hmm. And it's um, so, for example, the cadence and foot timing of a boxer, a square working breed, is not the same as the cadence and foot timing of a Doberman. They are different. And the boxer has an elastic quality that is described, you know, uses the word elastic. <clears throat> the Doberman does not, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. That it's described differently. You have to really hone into your very specific standard and sometimes compare it to another standard of a similar breed in order to see where your differences lie. I'm convinced that 
some of the boxer people, the new people who are breeding today have actually bred out that elasticity and possibly on purpose. Hey, Nikki, how are you? Welcome. Karen shows in Tampa, Florida. Who else is here? We haven't heard from very many people so far, but come on, tell us who you are, what your breed is. If you're at shows, can you just describe a Springer? Richard, would you describe a Springer, please? Well, another squarely built dog, not to be long and moving much the same. I think we're a mistake that a lot of doe boxer springer handlers do is they try to either in the training session with bait or with the tightness of the lead keep the head too high you must let that head drop two or three inches lower than when they're standing because all efficient powerful agile trotters need to have their head down a little bit so i see that head in the sky looking up view on some of these breeds moving around the around the ring and it's completely faulty and it almost accentuates some faults whether a dog is lifting his front legs too high up the more you keep that head up the more they're likely to lift their legs high off the ground instead of reaching outward and low to the ground so the head carriage when you're moving is so important and it's very much the same with you know a lot of the working breeds including springers yeah carriage is absolutely essential <clears throat> to breed type so we have marie uh in spokane with springer she says thank you for that i've seen some strung up more often we have bettina with shih tzu from denmark and kathy from wisconsin with burners tell us what you think your dog what the important key points of your breed is that you want the judges to consider. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we have Shelly from new with new fees. And we have Kat from the UK with Alaskan Malamutes. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jim, how are you? And um, Jenny has Irish wolfhounds and Scottish deerhounds. First time joining these Facebook lives. Welcome, Jenny. Thank mm -hmm. you for being here and commenting. So we had a comment from uh, a lady with a Shih Tzu and the standard reads quite clearly head and tail held high. But that's kind of a misnomer because for a Shih Tzu to move around the ring, it does should have its head drop a little bit. And we see so often in Shih Tzu, especially my breed, which I have so much experience about, people with too tight a lead. They're supposed to move effortlessly. If their front feet aren't touching the ground, it's not pretty, people. It may look flashy, <laughs> but it's not pretty. And another thing you talked about, cadence. And, and I push cadence into the style. There are many breeds that have a style going around the ring, a correct poodle, you know, with its, you know, beautiful gait has style going around the ring. And you could you can identify it as a breed essential that they have this style. And I think in the dope, the same thing. They have to look powerful, agile, and, you know, elegant all at the same time and the only way you're going to get that is to have an animated dog moving at the correct speed you know with its you know focus and you can see it in the ring they have the look of eagles and you can almost put that expression onto many other breeds if they looked like eagles and or stallions and or you know more efficient trotters you would give the judge a better impression. Now, I've watched dogs go around the ring and I said, oh my dog, that, that, that dog cannot move with any type of balance at all. It's just terrible. And it's because you ask the owners and you feel the dog, it's not in the correct muscle tone. And you say to them, well, he's not moving very well. He's well muscled, but he's just not moving well. Well, he runs in the field all day long. Well, I'm here to tell you, you must also do some exercise at the trot. That's why it's important to go to these 
handling classes once in a while where you do end up running around the <laughs> ring at a trot a lot, such that you develop the right muscles and musculature that your dog looks good moving at a trot. Uh, so absolutely. well muscled isn't enough it has to be well muscled at the speed that you're moving your dog around the ring and, and a, a popular phenomenon now with a lot of breeders and, and sometimes handlers because they don't have as much time as they're using the treadmill and the dogs are moving at a trot and some of those dogs look much better in the ring absolutely I, yeah. I, I having rottweilers i've always um advocated for having multiple ways of exercising your dog. And <clears throat> Nikki says that, um, hold on, what does Nikki say? I saw it earlier here. She talks about the cairn and it's, well, it's well, look, you know, want that nice here. workman like movement of the Karen Terrier. Right. You know, they're, you know, relatively short legged breed. And, uh, you know, their movement is, is quite spectacular when they have that focus. And, and what's more important than a Karen's animation and fireness? Right. You know, the all the carriers need to look fiery at from one moment in time in the ring yeah a lot of breeds like wheatons and, and some of the other breeds aren't as fiery but they must still have that stallion like workman like movement going around the ring i once had uh, peter green and i think every one of you have heard of that young man peter green he looked at one of my dogs and he went over it and i moved it and he said oh my god you sure have trained that dog to be a clever walker <laughs> because when he went over the dog, he found a bit of straightness in shoulder and felt it could have been more angulated in the rear. But when he watched it move, it moved with such balance that he termed it a clever walker. So remember, if you have a dog with an outstanding front, doesn't have the equally outstanding rear, they will not move balanced around the ring. And the vice versa is the same. If Unless you, you teach it. Unless uh, you teach it to. <laughs> that's, that is true. So if you had a mediocre front and a strong rear, you need to develop a speed or a cadence, a style with your own dog to teach it to be a clever walker. So don't just give up because there aren't any perfect dogs out there but moving your dog at different speeds till you find the right speed and they begin to look like a clever well-balanced walker so we don't all have perfect dogs training is an essential component of making your dog look good in the ring it, it sure is and thank you for that um, let's uh, look and see what people have been saying. Um, Nikki says it's a catch 22 because of a lot, a lot of judges say a dog is trolling when the head goes down and is asking for suggestions. And Megan says, I was told by a judge to slow down a bit because the dog can overreach and look like they move improperly if too fast. That is so for sure. There she goes. Nikki says, Cairn, erect tail, solid top line, reach and drive, great head, varmity expression, dark almond eyes. Mm -hmm. And that, that's and the, again, that's knowing the, all those essential points of your breed essence will help you to do your job in the ring. And your whole job is to show off the good points and minimize your dog's faults it sure is and, uh, you know it's it's nice to hear that now there's a difference between um i'm not sure whether you the per, what word was it it started with a d drooping or whatever word you used the head should not fall trolling. down trolling you know, trolling and that's generally seen when the head drops below the level of the top line that is more like trolling when your dog's head is at the level of your dog's top line a little lower than when it's standing that is the correct head position that will give your dog that look of a beautiful um you know well-balanced movement so you need to practice you need to have people watch or you watch your dog move with other people and develop that speed that is going to be most appropriate for your dog Absolutely. And, 
you know, a couple people here have said, Lori and Kat have said that uh, dogs are being moved too fast. And that's been going on for a long time. And as a judge, I'll usually stop the, um, the uh, movement and ask the handler to move the dog more slowly. And um, they usually are surprised, but they usually do it. Um, and the dog usually looks better. Uh, Kathy says, in Bernese, I have seen judges put up dogs that are not structurally correct or have poor movement. They're placing a lot of emphasis on markings. That's frustrating. Absolutely, particularly in the Bernese Mountain Dog that should have, this is a, it's, it's, it's a working breed, right? And it should have bone and substance and it should be able to walk well enough to pull a fairly heavy cart. And Kat yeah. says... Yeah. Alaskan Kathy. Malamute should have reach and drive, balance, well muscled, and screams breed type. I've seen a few of those, Kat. I have seen a few of those. And Kathy with her Bernies should appreciate that. Uh, yes, some judges overemphasize breed components like color and markings too much. In my own breed, the Shih Tzu, uh, those, you know, any color is permissible. So some judges will put up a terrible dog with extremely beautiful symmetric white faces and beautiful white mustaches with little narrow heads and tiny tiny eyes over some dog that would have maybe a mismarked or smutty face and has the correct head and expression for the breed broad round large round eyes strong broad square muzzle all of these things and instead they judge aesthetic things like color but you do get to know those judges and uh you know it's it's important for exhibitors to keep a list of what they feel truly is what some judges may overemphasize or underemphasize and again not all the, not all judges are as confident as other more experienced judges so there is a learning curve for some judges to learn to appreciate form and function, musculature, movement, and soundness that, you know, would prevent that dog from doing its function just because it's perfectly marked with every tan spot and white spot in the right spot doesn't mean it's going to be a very good working dog. So you need to balance that, and, and that's what judges do. But again, I do agree with Kathy. There are some judges that put too much emphasis on color and markings and not enough on uh, form and function and popular soundness and musculature that would even more help them do their job. Right. And, you know, sometimes, and, and to be fair, um, some judges haven't had the opportunity to see a really good specimen of your breed that moves correctly and that's built correctly. And, and that is not their fault. That is the fault of the exhibitors and, and, um, and the breeders. So some of these things go back to the breeders and we say, okay, well, if the Doberman should move correctly, right. Um, it's, it's going to move with close to the ground, foot timing and cadence, and it has a rhythm like a metronome, right? That's what we mean by cadence, the metronome. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when Jenny you mentions see that, that dog, uh, yeah, Jenny me? mentions that um, in Irish wolfhounds, you know, there so much focus is being put on that, you know, that size and big boned and enormous look, which is, you know, impressive. And, and, and it's important. No it's far. important for the breed. It's, yeah, but they it, still, it, it they differentiates still, itself from the Scottish Deerhound. Yes, but they still must be an agile hunter and mm -hmm. must have, you know, they, they must be able to move and swoop that head down to the ground and kill prey and what all. And uh, some of them, you know, look so clunky going around the ring, even though they're noble and enormous, but they just don't have the style and, and the, the, the function that you would know that, uh, you know, they can actually perform their task because, you know, the, these animals, you know, they got to be able to hunt. And, and uh, if they think their prey is standing still, 
No, they're dodging in and out of everything. And that dog has to be agile at a full gallop to change direction on a dime. Right. It's it's greyhound like. Yeah. It's a greyhound like dog. It says being that. too heavy and too clunky isn't a, isn't always such a good thing. <laughs> We are just about out of time, Richard. We have talked about so much today. And um, I am so grateful to all of you who have come and visited with us and asked good, really good questions. And that's that's what makes this show so fantastic is that you come and you ask questions and we give you answers. And um, absolutely, Michael, uh, thank you for your comments as well. And uh, if you're interested in learning more, uh, the Dog Show Mentor program is open for new members, dogshowmentor.org. And uh, feel free to private message me with further questions. Don't forget to join our Facebook group, Dog Show Mentor Owner Handlers is the name of it. And we're there for you. It's free and it's fun and you can ask questions there and um, I will be there to answer them if you tag me. All righty. And don't, uh, don't hesitate to contact me also. Um, I'm on Facebook and uh, Messenger. And uh, if you see me at a dog show, if I'm not busy, don't be afraid to ask me questions. You all know I can't get into long conversations with you while I'm a judge, but uh, answering quick questions and and not giving anyone the perception of an impropriety that you and I are best buddies I do not mind speaking to exhibitors if they do have a question so enjoy absolutely I'm headed to Idaho this weekend uh, and I will be with uh, Dan Sayers next week Wednesday and uh, he will be at Westminster Kennel Club and we're going to be talking then so thanks for being here. I'm Lee Whittier, founder, host, and dog show mentor. Bye, everybody. See you in the winter circle. All right. <laughs>